On behalf of my colleague, Dr. Matt Spangler from the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and me, welcome to this module entitled Genomics Basics. I'm Bob Weber, and I'll be your presenter for this module. I'm a professor and extension VD specialist at Kansas State University. I have a PhD in animal breeding and genetics from Cornell University and have more than 20 years experience working in beef cattle genetic evaluation systems here in the United States, working as both a breed association technical staff member as well as an academic. An overview of today's module includes a review of the glossary of genetics terms, some discussion on the organization of the bovine genome, identification and definition of single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs, a review of linkage and its importance in genetic and genomic evaluation, discussion on DNA SNP marker panels and their densities, and finally, a discussion about imputation and its application in beef cattle genomics. Our first step in discussion of the beef cattle genome is simply to get some bearing and understanding of what the genome looks like and how it's constructed. A good first step is to find genomics. So genomics is simply a branch of biotechnology that's concerned with applying the techniques of genetics and molecular biology to the genetic mapping and DNA sequencing of sets of genes or the complete genomes of selected organisms using high-speed methods with organizing the results in databases and with applications of the data as in medicine or biology. Compare proteomics. In beef cattle, genomics is simply collecting DNA samples and genotypes and organizing that information in a database and then eventually using that information to inform a beef cattle genetic evaluation that produces EPDs and selection indexes. Ultimately, those tools are what are used by beef producers in the United States and around the world to make selection decisions. One good step for understanding genomics in beef cattle is to have a good understanding and working knowledge of some genetics terms. To do that, we'll review this glossary. So what is a genome? A genome is simply the genetic material of an organism in its entirety. A chromosome is simply an organized compaction of DNA in the nucleus of a cell that contains genes. They occur in homologous pairs in beef cattle. And cattle have 30 pairs of chromosomes. A gene is a specific sequence of nucleotides that is a functional unit of inheritance and controls the transmission and expression of one or more traits by specifying the structure of a protein or controlling the function of other genetic material. A locus is simply a position on a chromosome of a specific gene. More terms here. An allele is any of the alternate forms of a gene. A nucleotide is the basic structural unit of DNA. The four alphabet letters for nucleotides include A, C, G, and T, and they become the coding language for the architecture of the genome and the DNA sequence. A QTL, or a quantitative trait locus, is a region of a chromosome associated with variation in a trait. One of the interesting aspects of genomics and beef cattle genetics is that the biology assures variation in the progeny. So there are some mechanisms that underlie basic genetics that help determine the amount of variation and ensure variation between generations um, from individual parent matings. Cattle have 30 pairs of chromosomes, so 29 autosomes are the non-sex determining chromosomes, and then one pair of sex determining X and Y as the two possible alternatives. Of course, XX defines the female and XY the male. 
cattle, like other mammals, are diploid in their chromosomal structure, so they have two copies of each chromosome. And each one of those in the pair derives from either the sire or the dam. During meiotic cell division that forms gametes, eggs and sperm cells are formed as haploids, so they get a random sample of the genetic material that, that parent has formed into uh, single copies of those chromosomes in each sperm or egg. So one chromosome from each pair at random moves into the gamete. That by itself, the Mendelian assortment, creates variation. Across the 30 pairs of chromosomes, an animal at random gets one or the other of its parents' chromosomes. That creates variation. Another source of variation comes from recombination or crossover events where chromosomes exchange material. So this creates a mixture of genetic material from, if we think about an individual, from its grandparents, such that they aren't equal in terms of their split, in terms of chromosomal contribution. Fertilization, so merging of the sperm cell and the egg cell to form an embryo, restores diploid, diploid chromosomal count. So the sperm and egg are each haploid, combining them restores diploid chromosome count, which is two copies of each gene. Again, alternate forms of those genes are called alleles. Here in the image is a bovine karyotype, or an image of the 30 pairs of chromosomes from cattle organized from the largest, chromosome 1, to the smallest, 29. And then we have X and Y, which are the sex-determining pair. This animal happens to be a male. So many of us have heard the adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. I'm not sure that holds true here, but this image is defined or designed to convey the central dogma of molecular biology. And that is that the chromosomal material organized, or rather the genetic material organized in chromosomes uh, stored within the nucleus of the cell, um, contains individual genes. And those genes contain the instructions for making proteins. Oftentimes, the coding sequence for a particular protein is in multiple pieces or exons across the chromosome. And those exons code individual pieces of a protein that are combined into a complex. So proteins can act alone or in complexes to form many cellular functions. So in this picture, as we move from top to bottom, represents the, the genome in its entirety, so all 30 pairs, the individual chromosomes that are compacted forms of DNA. The DNA contains a coding sequence using the nucleotides, the four characters that we use to define um, the coding sequence of A, C, G, and T. Um, and those contain the instructions then for formation of peptides and ultimately proteins that are used in the animal and influence its phenotype. So what is a SNP? You've probably heard the term SNP many times and maybe wondered what it stands for. So SNP simply stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. It's a fancy way of saying a change in a location of a single base pair. So in this example, highlighted here in the green box, is a GT SNP. So the top pair of letter sets represent the coding sequence from bovine chromosome 6, um, one copy that an animal has. And this is actual sequence from an animal. Um, and then the, the second set of um, characters here, the code of 2BTA6, represents the second allele. And you can see there in the top strand of each, we have um, GC for the um, one chromosome pairing, um, and TA. Remember, G and C and T and A are always paired together. But in this case, the chromosomes differ at this specific location for this specific nucleotide. Okay, one has a GC, the other has a TA. For convenience, we just call the top strand, so it's a GT SNP.
This mutation or change in coding sequence or polymorphism may be in the exon or the coding sequence for a gene. Chromosomes are divided up into exons and introns, exons being the coding sequence, and introns being the space in between genes that's typically thought of as non-coding. Mutations can occur in either location, either exons or introns. If they're in an exon, they may be causal of a change in the formation of a protein or enzyme that results in a difference in phenotype. But sometimes changes in the exon are silent and result in no change in the phenotype or protein structure. Here's an example, again, of a SNP or a change in the DNA sequence. The results of mutations or substitutions of SNPs can be that, depending on where the mutation happens, production of no gene product, so completely silences the gene product, uh, may produce a deformed gene product or have a partial, partial loss of function or a complete loss of function, depending on the peptide substitution that occurs. Or in some cases, no peptide change results or a peptide change that doesn't functionally change the shape of the protein or its behavior or function um, and results in no change in function. There are other sequence modifications that exist in mammals and in other animals and organisms. Um, and some of those include um, what are called indels, which are insertions or deletions. So big chunks of DNA inserted rather than a single nucleotide base change. So how are SNPs connected to differences in genetic potential? Well, one way that we've analyzed these differences is through a process of identifying quantitative trait nucleotides, which is an idea that's closely related to QTLs or quantitative trait loci. And the way this works is simply um, using the SNPs or the changes in DNA sequence as a way to identify a specific chromosomal fragment. So through molecular biology techniques, we can identify these individual um, changes or polymorphisms in the genome that are specific to a certain locus or location in the genome and identify which variant, which change or which letter nucleotide here um, is present. Then through statistical analysis, we may be able to form associations between changes in DNA sequence and ultimately changes in performance. It's important to note that in our current genomic technologies, that the DNA markers or SNPs that we use are frequently in the intronic region of the genes or of the chromosome. And since they're intronic, that means they're likely non-causal in terms of their mutation and simply provide a convenient way to track or identify pieces of DNA fragment from parent to offspring. In this case, we have an example where we have a single marker that has a GT substitution that's located slightly upstream from a QTN. This QTN is an unknown location, but has been demonstrated to have differential effects in terms of performance um, based on which um, SNP marker is present. So in this case, there's a favorable allele located where the green star is. And at that same position, associated with the T variation, which is non-causal and closely related or close on the chromosome to the unfavorable allele here, the blue star. Okay. So we simply use the GTs to identify does the animal have a favorable copy or an unfavorable copy of this unknown locus. It's accomplished through a variety of sophisticated statistical analysis to detect variation in performance associated with variation in DNA sequence. Another important concept to understand in genomics is the idea of linkage. And here, just a second ago, we described linkage through a process that's known as linkage disequilibrium. 
So linkage disequilibrium is the non-random association of alleles at different loci, i.e. the presence of statistical associations between the alleles at different locuses or loci that are different from what would be expected if the alleles were independently randomly sampled based on their individual allele frequencies. That's a fancy way of saying that there is a correlation or a relationship, an association, if you will, between variation at one locus and performance or variation in DNA sequence and another that results in differences in performance. So again, you can think of the correlation between SNP at different loci as a way to practically understand linkage disequilibrium. Loci that are close together have a strong correlation, i.e. that is one SNP is a marker for a latent QTN or one that's unknown and unobserved, but still has a function or is expressed uh, in the animals. If the differences in DNA sequence are far apart from the QTN, so the marker that we use that's intronic is very distant on the chromosome from the QTN, we would expect them to have a low correlation and so then not be in linkage disequilibrium. Genetic linkage is another idea um, that sounds similar to linkage disequilibrium, but it's slightly different in terms of conceptual understanding. So genetic linkage is the tendency of alleles that are located close together on a chromosome to be inherited together during the meiosis phase of sexual reproduction. So the Mendelian assortment during formation of sperm or egg. Genes whose loci are nearer to each other are less likely to be separated onto different chromatids during chromosomal crossover or recombination events, uh, therefore said to be genetically linked. Okay. So here's an example over on the right side in the bottom uh, illustration of three markers, um, three loci rather, A, B, and C. And as you can see, A and B are close together and C is somewhat distant. In a recombination event that occurs in between them, we see that A and B maintain their linkage, i.e. they inherited big A, big A together, but we see that big C and little c now become inverted or separated um, from their corresponding capitalization of A and B. This recombination event creates um, a break in the linkage between A, B, and C. One of the other frequent discussions in the beef industry is about different densities in marker panels and the impact it has on genetic evaluation. Certainly over time, technology dramatically improved um, and cost structures have decreased for genotyping in beef cattle. So here's an example of two different um, SNP panels, uh, sort of what we used to call a high density, which is actually sort of a medium density SNP panel now, a 50K panel, or 50,000 SNPs located across the 30 pairs of chromosomes. And in this case, we've got um, um, a gene here in the middle and the markers um, that are associated with differences in that gene um, are roughly about 70,000 base, base pairs apart. Okay, so in breed one, we see a, an AC combination, breed two, a TG combination um, used to uh, genotype this particular set of gene variants. In the B panel here, the lower panel, um, we have an illustration of the marker density for a 700,000 SNP panel. So 700,000 markers um, spread around the genome. Roughly now, instead of being 70,000 base pairs apart, they're roughly about 5,000 base pairs apart. Okay, so they're much closer together. And we can use that to genotype animals and understand differences potentially in their genetic expression for this latent or unknown gene here in the middle. The bovine genome consists of about 3.5 billion base pairs. Okay, and so a 3K panel um, uh, results in about one SNP every 1.2 megabase apart, so 1.2 million base pairs in between. Okay. So some panel comparisons. Um, 
the original 50K, which was the hallmark um, high density genotyping platform in beef cattle is actually no longer available in its original incarnation. Improvements have been made over time to um, make that panel um, much more functional um, and have resulted in some dramatic changes in the construction of high density genotype panels in the beef industry. Um, some of those include very high density panels. So the Illumina 770K panel, which is illustrated here in terms of the size of the circle to represent a very large panel. Um, uh, GGP Super LD, which is a 19,000 panel available from Neogen. Um, and GGP HD um, for Bostaris, which is about 70,000 markers. Okay, so we have a variety of marker densities available um, for genotyping. And these differences result in different um, markers in common between the various um, uh, marker sets. And this is important when we think about making a trans position between different marker densities for genetic evaluation. Here in the United States, the 50K panel is still the ubiquitous panel used in genetic evaluation. But as I mentioned earlier, we don't actually genotype on that panel anymore. So we use some statistical processes called imputation to predict 50K genotypes from DNA markers of other density, DNA marker panels, excuse me, of other densities. So this poses a question of resolution and which one is the best? Well, it turns out that a variety of densities are actually quite useful in our genetic evaluation um, systems and research work. Um, but at the end of the day, having a common language to work under for genetic evaluation that's conducted on a routine basis is very important. If we think about the differences in densities as a way to um, understand how much information is potentially included in a marker um, panel. We can think about uh, examples to sort of help us conceptualize the space in between individual markers uh, across uh, the entire uh, chromosomal content or genome of an animal. So if we think of the bovine genome as a distance from Washington DC to Anchorage, Alaska, that's roughly about 3,300 miles, okay? If we think about the 3K marker panel density, that's equivalent to having a DNA marker roughly every mile along that path. So if I told you that there was um, a pot of gold located somewhere on this path between Washington DC and Anchorage, and I gave you two markers um, that were adjacent to each other along that path, um, if it was off of a 3K panel, I could get you within one mile or half a mile, um, depending on where it's located, of that particular um, pot of gold. If instead I used a 50K marker panel as the reference for that, those locations, and I gave you two adjacent markers um, and told you the pot of gold was in between them, that would get you within about 100 yards of the pot of gold. And, a 700K panel is the reference, results in a DNA marker roughly every 22 feet, or a marker post every 22 feet, so a much smaller distance to go hunting for your pot of gold. Again, the cattle genome represents about three gigabases or three billion base pairs, um, and roughly about 22,000 genes are coded across the genome, and about 14,000 of those are conserved across mammalian species. I mentioned imputation earlier as a mechanism to help us predict or move from one genotyping platform to another. And it turns out that imputation is a very important process um, for genetic evaluation systems here in the United States. As I mentioned earlier, um, we don't actually genotype animals directly on 50K, but it continues to be sort of the common language that we use in our genetic evaluation genomic enabled prediction systems. So imputation uses a haplotype analysis to predict higher density, or in some cases, a lower density genotype. Um, oftentimes, the accuracy of this imputation um, is better than 95%, oftentimes 98 or 99%. Um, the resulting uh, molecular breeding values are strongly correlated with those from um, animals that have an actual 50K genotype versus those with a simulated or modeled 50K um, imputed um, genotype. 
the gaps in the genotype represent regions of crossover events. So where we can't make an informed um, imputation is, is a spot where there's been a crossover event and we have dissociation of parental genotypes. Um, and so we can impute then from uh, typically a, a low 3K panel up to um, 7 or 8K up to 50K and or down from 70K or 800K back to 50. Um, we can also use the DNA sequence or the DNA uh, marker data uh, to impute clear to sequence if we have sequence data available. One of the benefits of using imputation is that we get lots of bang for the buck. So we can genotype a lot of animals at low density and capture almost as much information from those genotypes as if we genotype them on much higher densities, if we have lots of population data available to impute from. That population data is used to define the various haplotypes that exist and allow us to fill in the blanks, if you will, um, in our imputation process. So here's an example of imputation. Um, here's a sire that's been genotyped on a high density um, genotyping platform. And so we've got very dense data. Um, and here we've got an offspring um, that has been genotyped on a low density panel. Um, so we find that the common markers between them here are the ones illustrated in green on the sire's HD panel. And in the calf, it also genotyped GA, just like the sire did in green GA. The process of imputation then allows us to basically fill in the gaps. We know that the calf got this particular um, sequence of DNA from the haplotype based on this genotyping exercise. And so what we do is we can simply fill in the gaps, right? So um, we know the sire was um, CAG on the very left, and so we can go ahead and fill that in. We can fill in the space between the G and the A with ATAGG, um, basically producing a higher density genotype based on the haplotype that was observed in the sire and then subsequently just filled in for this particular calf. Some imputation scenarios, again, 50K is the ubiquitous genotype that's currently used in uh, genomically enhanced genetic evaluations here in the United States. And we can move from a variety of genotyping densities to 50K and use that information um, as basically a substitute or proxy in the genetic evaluation. So we can move from a low cost, low density panel up to 50K. Um, or if we've genotyped, say, some AI sires or donor dams um, on higher density platforms, we can move those back to 50K for genetic evaluation. One of the advantages is that it allows us to reduce genotyping costs, so we can genotype more animals in the case of uh, using LD panels, but it also lets us use some genotype information um, perhaps from legacy genotyping platforms, ones that are no longer produced or genotyped on due to a variety of changes in technology, um, but it still allows us to gather information um, out of those genotyping platforms. Okay. In summary, beef cattle genomics is providing new information on the genetic diversity and inheritance of economically important variants in the beef cattle population. Cattle have 30 pairs of chromosomes, and they're, that's diploid, Okay. Mendelian assortment and recombination assure genetic variation in subsequent generations. Genetic variation that we have to manage, but also provides us the opportunity for genetic improvement and selection. SNP DNA marker panels provide uh, useful tools um, for exploring the genetic effects in beef cattle. And imputation provides a cost-effective method to increase the information in a genotype based on higher density genotypes or sequence information. For continued learning, I'd suggest that you complete module number eight, which is pedigree validation and DNA parentage testing. Some related concepts to, to this discussion include beef genetics basics in module one, again, pedigree validation and parentage DNA testing in module eight, and genomically enabled genetic evaluations in module nine. For more information on the US Livestock Genetics Export organization, visit their website at www.uslge.org.